from dozens of the network TV shows like the Today Show and the History Channel and Solved Mysteries, America's Most Wanted. Casey just signed a movie deal. This is very exciting. With Moody Pictures, Moody Street Pictures, I should say, which is in Waltham. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, they're in Waltham. They're great. Uh, for his latest bestseller, Bad Blood. So look out, Dennis Lehane. We've got uh, Casey on the scene. Um, Casey at the bat. And I, I want to thank you, Casey, for asking me to do this. I've, ha I've had a great time. Is everybody having a good time? And I say, we're not telling you. We're not telling you. Okay. All right, so tonight, Casey is here to talk about two thrilling true stories that are close to his heart, ladies and gentlemen, Casey Sherman. I want to thank you again for all coming out here tonight. Um, I'm the son of a son of an Irish storyteller. And consider me the accidental author, so to speak. Like Sarah and Hank, I've spent a career in television news. Unlike these ladies, uh, my work was done behind the scenes as a TV news producer. I wasn't thrust into the spotlight, so to speak, until I began to work on the Boston Strangler case. Now, this was a personal crusade for me, which began well over 20 years ago. Because you see, my aunt, 19-year-old Mary Sullivan, was considered the youngest and the last victim of this notorious 1960s murder spree. Now, the Boston Strangler case is considered the first so-called serial killer case in American history. The first to really capture the world's attention since Jack the Ripper stalked the women of London back in the 1880s. But unlike the victims in the Jack the Ripper case, the victims in the Boston Strangler case, well, you know, they weren't prostitutes. Instead, they came from all walks of life. And that's what made this case truly frightening. From June 1962 to January 1964, 11 women were murdered in the greater Boston area in a kill zone that stretched from Columbia Road in Dorchester, 40 miles north to Lawrence. Now, as I said, my aunt was considered the youngest and the last victim of the strangler, but her murder was also considered the most brutal. Mary Sullivan's body was found on January 4th, 1964, by her two roommates who had just returned home to their apartment on Beacon Hill. When they entered the apartment, they noticed the bedroom door was open, the light was off, and there was a, a shadowy figure sitting on the bed. Well, they thought it was Mary, and they called out her name several times, but she didn't answer. So they entered the bedroom, they turned on the light. That's when they saw the horror. Mary had been strangled. In fact, Mary had been strangled with two scarves and a nylon stocking that were wrapped tightly around her neck. Now, Mary had also been sexually assaulted with a broomstick. The handle of the stick was still protruding out of her body for all the world to see. And the killer also had a macabre sense of humor because he left a Happy New Year card placed by her left foot. Now, my grandparents, Mary's parents, well, they received word of this horrible crime at their home on Cape Cod later that evening. The call didn't come from the authorities Instead, the call came from a newspaper reporter who asked my grandfather, you know, do you have a daughter named Mary Ellen Sullivan? Oh, my grandfather said, no. No, I have a daughter named Mary Ann Sullivan. Well, my grandfather had forgotten that Mary had changed her middle name during Catholic confirmation. When he realized his mistake, he said, oh, God, what hospital is she in? And the newspaper reporter said, no, sir, your daughter's in the morgue. Now just imagine how my family felt at that time. Imagine how all of New England felt at the time of the Boston Strangler. No woman felt safe. In fact, ordinary women walked around with switchblades in their pocketbooks. They bought guard dogs for added protection. They called on the authorities to get this madman off the streets. But in the two and a half year reign of terror of the Boston Strangler, no one would be arrested in this case. In fact, no one would ever be charged with any of the Boston Strangler murders. Now, 10 months after my aunt was killed, a handyman from Chelsea, Massachusetts, named Albert DeSalvo, was arrested on unrelated sexual crimes that he did commit. Now, DeSalvo was a, was a curious criminal, uh, to say the least. He was a con man, he was a sexual predator, and he was a thief. 
He was also the most bungling crook that you can ever imagine. He got arrested for just any crime that he committed. Now, he was also um, a guy that generated a lot of, of nicknames for himself during his you know, so-called criminal career. First, they called him the measuring man because he used to pass himself off as a, as a model agent, agency scout and sexually assault women. Next, they called him the green man because he wore a green workman's uniform to get him access into certain apartments in the city. Now, as I said, Albert DeSalvo wasn't necessarily a bright man, but he didn't have to be because his cellmate at Bridgewater State Hospital where Albert DeSalvo was being housed, he was smart. He was smart to the level of genius. His name was George Nasser. George Nasser was a, a cold-blooded killer, if there ever was one. But he saw Albert DeSalvo, and he, he noticed that here's a man facing decades in prison. He's got a wife and two children on the outside with no means to support them. So he said, Albert, you know, we can get money for your family. Take a look at this Boston Strangler case. There, there's a lot of money to be made with the reward money that's being offered for the capture of the Strangler. He goes, let me bring my lawyer in, see what we can do. Well, that lawyer's name was Effley Bailey. And Effley Bailey entered the scene and said, Albert, I can do you some better. I can get you a book deal. I can get you a movie deal. I can make it so that you are never sent to prison. Because in Albert DeSalvo's heart, he was a coward. La the last place he wanted to be was in prison. And it was just a win-win for Albert DeSalvo because Bailey had suggested that instead of going to prison, he'd be studied in a psychiatric hospital for the rest of his life. So for Albert DeSalvo, he said, sure. He confessed to these murders. And he was later put on trial, but not for the Strangler case. He was put on trial for the Green Man rapes that he did commit, and he went off to prison. Now, I didn't know my Aunt Mary. I was born five years after she was killed. I only knew her from her portrait, which hung above the mantelpiece in my grandparents' home. Now, I grew up in a big Irish Catholic family. You can imagine things like that just weren't talked about. I had heard whispers growing up about Mary's death and about the Boston Strangler, but I never, I never put the two together and I never felt comfortable broaching the subject to my family until I saw the film, The Boston Strangler, on Dana Hersey's movie loft when I was a teenager. Now the film was uh, released in 1968. It was well done at the time. Tony Curtis played Albert DeSalvo. Uh, Henry Fonda played the lead investigator. So I thought, geez, now I finally know what really happened to Mary. Well, the next day, I finally broached the subject to my mother, Diane. Now, out of six children in that Irish Catholic family, my mother, Diane, who was 17, and Mary, who, were, who was 19, well, they were the closest in age. They were also the closest in character. And I went to my mother. I said, Mom, Mom, tell me about Mary. And she said, Casey, Mary just wasn't my sister. Mary was my best friend. And my mother talked about all of the plans that they had made together for their lives, to live their lives in parallel paths, raising their children together, growing old together as sisters and best friends. And that was all stolen from my mother. And I could see she was beginning to get a little emotional about it. So as, as any you know, child would do, I leaned down and I, I gave her a hug. And I said, Mom, you know, at least they got the guy. And she said, no, Casey. No, they never did. Now, my mother didn't have any evidence to back up this theory. It was merely a sister's intuition. It was a bond between two sisters that couldn't be broken, even in death. Well, that bond led me to journalism school. That bond led me to where I am today. And at first, I wanted to prove that my mother was wrong, that Albert DeSalvo was who he claimed to be, because he was a bad guy. 